It's that time again, the Manage to Win podcast. We are back, and this episode is with Sri Chalepa. He is the president and co-founder of Engagedly, and they are doing strategy and performance management, employee engagement tool online, a startup that's about seven years old. And he's got some great business tips for us. Don't forget our sponsor, Habitly.com, where you can improve your best habits make them even stronger. And also take those ones that hurt you, like poor time management, or maybe you get angry too much, or you set goals and then don't achieve them. Whatever it might be, soft skills, go to habitly.com, seven days free. You can't go wrong. We're going to dive into this conversation with Shri. He's got a lot of tips on what it's like to be a startup. And what do you do if you're entering a crowded space or you're part of a crowded space? How do you differentiate yourself? Let's dive in and find out. Shri, you are in a very competitive space. As a matter of fact, why don't you talk about the space to the audience a little bit? But um, how, how do you compete in that space? I mean, it's kind of like catch up, but then again, you're trying to flip some things, I'm sure, give people new ways to do things that are better. But what's, what's your approach that's able to, uh, you know, help your team grab market share? Yeah, it's a really good question, um, David. I think the the key here is to differentiate enough in the market because you don't necessarily need to compete on every facet of the competition. Um, so when when somebody is competing on a space, you want to figure out how do you compete in a space that's slightly different than they are and offer a differentiated um, service or offering. So in our case, you know, one of the things that really makes us unique and different is that in the HR tech performance management goal setting space, one of the things that makes us different is our unique focus on taking a very uh, holistic approach to employee engagement. So when you take an employee engagement based approach to performance management, that makes it very different. Uh, the other aspect is very different is the fact that we have a learning management system as well. And we have a lot of partnerships uh, as part of that that really offer offers our client um, a suite that is a lot more broader than looking at only one aspect of the of the product. Um, so there are multiple ways to really uh, look at it. Uh, our, our focus is on the mid market, uh, so we are not really trying to go after enterprise, but we're also not trying to go after very very really small companies. Uh, so knowing that really helps us as well. Well, talk to me about that more because I think that's one of the challenges with. A lot of companies, they try to be everything to everybody and they don't really. So if I was looking at your company engagedly, what would be the thing that would jump out to me that, oh, wow, they do this thing really, really well? If you looked at the space we are in, you can either get a product that is a full heavy product like an ERP, right? That big companies would use for, for, for employee uh performance management and employee talent management. Or you can get a really small uh, company-based products that are very easy to use, but they're functionally very light, right? I think what makes us interesting is, is, is we are in that intersection where organizations that are not too big, they, you know, they're mid-market, 200, 500 employee organizations, but they still need a robust product. So how do you provide the robustness of a product at a lower price point at a lower implementation cost at a high enough service value so that you know that they're not going to get from a big fortune 500 type of software company but is still easy to use and has the functionality that they need to be, to, to to that intersection is where i like to uh, you know be at so an example of that you know is is hubspot for example right hubspot is in that mid-market space where they have enough functionality that most companies in that space can use it, but it's also fairly easy to use compared to some of the other bigger products out there. Um, but it also has the functionality that you know covers 80 to 90% of what those companies need. So we are in the same model as HubSpot in many ways in the HR tech space. Okay, well, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I um, to use that comparison, I tried HubSpot. I thought it had too many bells and whistles for me. You know, I wanted something right. that was more streamlined. Correct. And I think Correct. that um, when you look at the HR product space, um, and I have not done an in-depth look 
in, in recent years. I was much more active in that um, back in um, the uh, early 2000s. So like 2002 to 2000, um, early January 2006, so many years ago. But um, I do glance at packages once in a while. And I find that it, that it gets really, and I have not looked at yours, so I have no comment on that. But I do find it gets really kludgy as you try to move through the product. And um, there's things that just, it really comes down to UI. You know, software is so much UI based. How do you get the UI that really makes where you feel your UI is better? What do, what do you go through to make certain that that, that user experience is superior. So we have a customer advisory group that we work with, uh, where we have some key customers who are very active advocates of our product, but also are active users of the product who do not shy from giving us feedback, right? They're not the quiet people. And so <laughs> those are the ones that we really want because you want to hear those complaints or you want to hear the challenges they're facing. So every quarter or thereabouts, we have a, a, a discussion with the customer advisory group uh, where we get feedback from them. And whenever we do a launch, you know, we do a, a beta launch on a new tool, speci uh, specifically to one or two of those customers in a customer advisory group and get feedback from them. So as we do that, you know, on an ongoing basis, we get feedback that we incorporate in our product lifecycle. Um, so it is, a, it is an iterative process, you know, because we don't always get everything right. Um, and then what might work for one or two customers may not work for the other two customers. So there's that problem as well. So you have to figure out what's best for the customer cohort you are going after. Uh, because there's going to be all, all, always those outliers where either the product is too difficult to use or, or it's not functional enough for them to use. It could be any of those two extremes. Um, so I think uh, you got to figure out what your, what your space is so that you're satisfied satisfying the needs of those 80% that's in the, that's in the middle. Yeah, I, I think this applies even to companies who aren't developing software, but how many how many clients do you have in that advisory group? Uh, the advisory group is varies between 8 and 10 clients depending on uh you know the some of them come in and out but typically about 8 and 10 and and we end up at least talking to about four or five of them every quarter. Okay? Okay. And what was kind of the light bulb moment when you were either pre-development? So maybe you went through, we talk a lot about overcomers on the show, people who have overcome adversity or some other thing, but um, what really led you to start this company and go into, you know, a very crowded space, which I'm not saying, I'm sure there's opportunity, but it makes it more difficult. What led you to just say, hey, I can do this better? Yeah, I think. When we started the company, those are seven years ago, seven and a half years ago. Um, the products in HR space were very much an administration oriented products. They were, uh, you know, systems of record. So even performance reviews or goal setting or HRIS tools were very much built for the administrators. Um, and then what we noticed was that employee engagement was a problem. Everybody was talking about it and they're still talking about it. Um, and there was no product really focused on driving better employee engagement. You know, we, at that point, the, the employee engagement meant you ran employee engagement service, and that was it. It wasn't like, what are you actually doing to drive better engagement, not just measuring it. Um, so Engagely was born out of that premise that we can actually build systems for the companies who actually want to drive better engagement. So one of the things that we did very early on you know, product was making making it very much a community driven platform. So, so we were very strong on a social component within our platform seven and a half years ago. So it's almost like an internal Facebook, but built for organizations, right? Um, there was a aspect of collaboration. There was an aspect of praise and recognition. And then we gamified it where people got points and badges and they could unlock different levels within the, within the product. But when they did certain things like give a praise, or like get a positive feedback or achieve a certain knowledge or a learning training or something like that. So we gamified the whole thing. And that is very unique. Nobody did that back then, really, you know? Yeah. I mean, they may have done it for a few pieces like engagement, but we did it across the platform. So even now, you can we have gamified learning, we've gamified goal achievement, we've gamified various different actions in the platform, and, and that can make it more fun and, and, and interesting while moving the ball forward for the organizations as well. 
So you talk about fun, and then I noticed in the notes that you actually um, work an, a 14-hour workday. Is that like the average workday? Because that doesn't do, leave a lot of extra I time. do mostly a, mo- uh, a lot of 14-hour days, you know. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't say I do it every day. Uh, and and that's not really the goal either. Um, but when you are growing in your uh, resource trap, where I don't necessarily have the luxury of hiring an army of high-performing executives, um, I have to do a lot of the work myself, uh, at least at the at that level. So I end up doing a lot of hours, and it's uh, hopefully not like that, you know, a year out from now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I hope not. But how do you balance kind of your your physical, your mental fitness with in time with people that are special to you, that type of thing? You know, I have this uh, three, the three-step approach to, to mental and physical um, stamina, if you will, which is sleep, diet, exercise, right? Everybody talks about that, but I talk about it in that specific order. The number one thing that I think every person needs is good sleep. And to me, a minimum of seven hours is almost mandatory for me. I don't always get it, but I try really hard to get seven hours. Yeah. And then, because if I do that, that's at least one out of three that's done. And it's the most important thing. You know, diet obviously is important. So eating well, you know, staying off alcohol and things like that, that really can mess up your sleep and your energy levels um, is important. Uh, eating lots of vegetables and, um, you know, ha- having a healthier diet is important. And the third part is obviously exercise. Uh, I try to get in um, at least five to six days a week of working uh, exercise. Um, I definitely do at least two miles of walking a day. Um, I, I walk my dog twice a day, and that's like my break away from computers and phones. I try not to take any gadgets with me when I go on those walks. So um, so those are some of the things I do to get you know that breaks you need throughout the day. So what do you do when you're on the walk and you get that idea that you need to remember or you get those three or five or seven ideas? How do you remember them when you get back from the walk if you don't have something to jot it down with? Well, I that's a good point. I try not to think about work too much when I'm walking. I try to just stay away from thinking about work and just enjoy the surrounding, you know, the birds, the traffic, the my dog, you know, spend just look at the environment, if you will. So I try to do that. Um, I do get ideas, obviously. You cannot stop you know, ideas from coming to you or thinking about work. But when I do come back, and I, I obviously keep a notepad next to me at all times, which so I, I, will, I will write it down at that point. Yeah. I do like the screen break and really enjoying nature, just enjoying the dog. What type of dog you have? I have a black lab pit bull mix. Um, he's a rescue. So, yeah, it's yeah. fun dog. Yeah, sounds like a good. I'm a dog guy, so sorry. I I have a great Pyrenees mix. It's 110 pounds, so uh, oh my god, and she she's great. So, uh, but you can't go wrong with a lab and a pit bull that's in a positive environment are wonderful dogs too. So, it's probably a great dog. Yeah, he's a great dog. He's a very nice yeah. dog, very friendly, loving dog. Yeah, Little yeah. Lady. So, so yeah. you know, you have all this stuff going on, and as you say, you have to still wear you know a fair amount of hats, and so. Um, how do you prioritize what you're doing each day, each week, when I'm sure the, the more success you have, the more demands there are on your time? That's uh, really, uh, I do think about that a lot. How do I prioritize? And I think the what I look at is what is the number one thing that is stopping me from moving forward? When I say me or engagedly in that in that context, right? What is that one thing that's moving, stopping me from moving forward? And just really focus on that. And, I, and it's usually just two or three things. If you try to focus on more than that, you're really diluting your focus. So I try to focus on those one or two things that I really need to do to move the needle and just focus on those things. And then obviously there are all these little minor things you got to do along throughout the day, which you can take care of for when, you're, when you don't have a lot of energy to think about that. You know, like answering, answering some emails, you know, checking into some you know, your bank account and paying bills or whatever it is. Those things you can do at, a, at what I would call a low energy mode. But for the high energy, high impact, you got to focus on only one or two things. And try, I try to block out things um, to be able to do that. Um, 
you know i think warren buffett actually talked about talks about this you know just focus on one thing that's going to really make a difference and and try to get that done yeah yeah no it makes i totally agree totally agree and so do you spend any time monthly or quarterly where you kind of get away on your own or with your executive team to really just focus on strategy and what those one things might be that are coming up yeah usually so we are a big believers in okrs uh, objectives and key results uh, we have I mean, our platform also supports okrs um, so we do okrs every quarter and at the beginning of each quarter um, we spend about two weeks you know on on planning what we need to accomplish that quarter at a broad level and then each executive takes on specific goals for their own selves and their teams to accomplish for that quarter and then we do a monthly check in um every month on those okrs as a team where we keep each other accountable for that so that's definitely something we do and then at the end of each year um right around this time actually we are going through an annual panel planning and strategy process so we'll typically bring in a consultant or somebody to help us out because otherwise you know you can't really um moderate yourself you need somebody to moderate the the group so i i, I try to bring in somebody um once a year and we do a, a planning session and a strategy session so that we're all aligned as a as a team yeah do you find when you bring in that third party that they they also add some perspective or challenge you to address things that maybe you would overlook as a group because you're kind of in a certain rhythm or are they just kind of policing the time and kind of moving things the agenda items along well i try to bring in somebody who understands our space so they are they are adding value outside of just being a a moderator you know they actually understand the space they they bring in their own research as well and their understanding of the industry the environment so they are adding a little bit of color to our discussions for sure yeah 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 are there times when you disagree with the person and you kind of have a um a respectful debate and but you know that doesn't mean oh, you the, don't gain something from it but you don't necessarily go with what they're saying yeah well no we have to right because uh, if we don't buy into it uh, we we can't just do it because a moderator told us to or this facilitator told us to um so we have to buy into it so i think we, there is obviously room for debate and we have to buy into it as a team otherwise it's not going to work and in that annual planning process is that something that also incorporates interactions with your customer advisory group that is an input to this planning yeah. process so they do like the one we are doing right now they've already done some interviews and they're running a survey with their customers um they also are you know now that we can record a lot of our conversations with our customers so they're reviewing that get a sense of what our customers sentiments are and their overall strategy the customer strategy as well is is an input so those things are all fed into this process okay hey, and you know you've been doing this startup for i think you said about 7 years so if you're talking to other entrepreneurs what would you warn them about um how they might be stuck in their startup Well, you kind of married to it, right? I mean, the thing is, people don't realize, and I didn't realize it in my younger days, is that any startup or any initiative you do, it's a long journey. If you're not prepared to be on this journey for seven to ten years, don't do it. You know, it's very rare that you'll get lucky in two years and make a hundred some million dollars and get get an exit. That's not that's not the norm. It's the reason you hear about it is because they are. truly an exception that's why they make the news um so if you are not really committed and if you're part and more importantly you and your partners are both not committed for 7 to 10 years yeah don't do it at partnership either with your partners you know you have to be saying okay this is going to be a 7 to 10 years of grueling work and n- nobody gets out for that for that time period yeah. <laughs> you're all locked in <laughs> you're all locked in yeah yeah now my understanding is your company also uses some or a fair amount of freelancers so like how does that fit in with with your plans and why did you choose to go that route well we have to use freelancers because there are so many skills and tools we need along the way where we don't necessarily need to hire somebody full time like if we need somebody to do a website design i don't need to have somebody on this on the staff 
just doing that because I'm not changing a website every three days, right? Or every week. So yeah. I need a freelancer to help with that. Um, and if you're running a special campaign, we use freelancers for that. Um, and sometimes freelancers, you know, come in with better ideas because you know, they have exposure to other clients they're working with and they're always staying on top of the trends. So it, it helps to have freelancers seed in new ideas and new uh, creative approaches as well. Yeah, yeah. So, and um, do you ever use freelancers for any of your programming or development or UI needs? Because we don't. Uh, I mean, we some specific technology. Sometimes we've hired freelancers for that we may not have skills in house, but that's more of a, a stopgap measure. But typically, not typically, we just don't use any freelancers for that. No, for not for engineering work, not for development. Yeah. For design work, yes, sometimes we've used design work. Um, when we don't necessarily have all the talent in house to do that. So, uh, what are you finding as far as um, what are you hearing from your clients in regards to um, what are the top things that they're doing or you're doing to better engage employees? So, they you br you brought that up early on. It's kind of how you define develop the software. But really engaging people. I mean, we have people now. There's there's a lot of quitting going on. There is people trying to work two or three jobs simultaneously because they're working remote. There's um, you know you you've got a lot of people coming in that don't have good soft skills, so they really don't have good habits of being fully productive. Although they might interview well, um, what are they doing to write really engage their people so? Um, they're doing their best for not only them themselves, but also for the company. You know, the number one thing that I recommend and I talk about with our customers and I see customers doing that drives better engagement is for their managers to do one-on-ones with their employees yeah. every week, weekly one-on-ones. Now, that could be problematic in some cases where a manager may have 10 or 12 direct reports. Um but obviously that should be not the case. But if assuming that's not the case and you have a, a span of control that's more like seven or eight people and not more than that, um, that's, in, that's the one thing you can do to drive better engagement is to do one-on-one. -on -one. And it doesn't have to be an agenda either. You, it's good to have an agenda for that one-on-one, -on -one, but it doesn't have to have an agenda. It can just be you just connecting with that employee to see how their day went, how their month or week's going, or what type of challenges are they facing in their work? What can they do uh, as a manager to help them uh, you know, be their best selves um, or achieve their goals in their projects they're working on, things of this nature, right? Could be anything open ended like that. Um, so I would say that's basically the number one thing I would recommend. And I see our clients doing really well. And our tool obviously has tools to do one on ones as well. Um, the second thing is important is to have career discussions and development discussions. Um, one of the techniques that I was listening to. Um, in one of my podcasts, because I run a podcast as well, is um, a, a, every eight weeks, every two months, have one, a one-on-one -on -one discussion focused just on employee development. So focusing on what do they need to do to grow, what are they looking to learn, where are they looking to go from your career perspective, or just from you know new areas they want to work on and ex explore so that they're not stuck in this rut where they're doing the same thing every, every day in, day out, you know. Make the life more interesting. Make make them make them feel like they're progressing in their in their in their career. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think the one on ones are important. And when I when I do it myself or when I talk with clients, I encourage them to just like have the one on ones. Even if you need to shorten it, try never to cancel it. Uh, reschedule or do it short for a shorter period of time. If you're normally going to talk for an hour, you know, even if you touch base for fifteen minutes. Yeah. Um, I advise that, you know, an agenda can help. You do need to have a touch touch base. How are you doing? And if there's a real need there, then that may chew up a lot of the meeting time. But otherwise, you kind of work through confirming, you know, commitments and their meeting standards. So kind of confirming the past and then moving to the present, what the challenges are, and then what's the plan until we meet again type of thing. So I agree with you. I think it, it really helps engage people. And then the, I totally agree with you on the career piece, too, in that uh, we never want to lose somebody because they don't feel they have a future. Right. Right. And I was looking at this uh, Gallup research that came out on why people were quitting during this great quitting that happened last year and or early this year as well. Um, and a lot of it was related to job flexibility. Um, 
and growth within the organization. They didn't, they didn't feel like they had a future there. Yeah. You know? And those two things are easily solvable if you have the right management approach, because they're not necessarily asking for more money or bigger bonuses. Um, they ask for a little bit of flexibility in their life because of all the stuff we have going on now um, with remote work. But also, uh, you know, how, how do I grow from this role? I can't, I, I don't want to keep doing the same thing again and again every day and, and not feel like I'm making progress in life. Yeah, and I, I think the key words you said, if I remember them correctly, were if you have the right management approach. <laughs> yes. It's true. It's true. I was listening to somebody yesterday where this is a major bank, apparently in New York or whatever, where they're mandating people come into their office three days or four days a month, which is fine, except they're saying you can pick any three, four days in a month to come in, which doesn't make sense. If your goal is to come in to collaborate with other people and build a culture, then they should all be coming in the same three days, yeah, not yeah. on any three days you choose to, right? That's it right. doesn't make any sense. So that's where a good management approach <laughs> would probably take a different <laughs> approach. Yeah, good intentions, bad execution. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. or weekly, right? Some uh, some other banks are asking, uh, or banks, or, this is happening a lot more in New York than probably anywhere else, but um, where they're asking people to come in two days a week, but any two days a week. So they go in and they're by themselves with yeah. nobody from the team there. <laughs> you know, some other person is there from a different group. They don't even really know them. They don't have anything in common, yeah. in terms of the work. So it doesn't serve any purpose, you know? Yeah, it's interesting how it's going to shake out how the companies who really want, like you've got some companies, whether it was Facebook or whatever, that was saying, we want you back every day, you know, no more remote work. And then you're going to have some hybrid and then you're going to have more that are on the remote side. And how that all, all that all, all works after people have kind of been spoiled to go live wherever they want yep. to live and then yeah. set their own hours and, and do things. So it's yeah. it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting, but it gives a, a companies like us an advantage because now we can offer that, and and the talent will will gravitate towards companies who can who can do that. You know. Oh yeah, yeah, so. definitely. All right. Well, you know, I'm really love what you had to say. I, I'm interested in your product. Need to check it out. See what you got going on there. I encourage the audience to do that too. But where do they go if they want to learn more about you, Shri, or or your company, Engagely? Yeah, so engagely.com is the, our website, E-N-G-A-G-E-D-L-Y.com. Um, they can also check me out on uh, LinkedIn, which is where I usually uh, stay pretty active. I'm pretty vocal with my beliefs and opinions on the subject. Um, it's uh, Shrikant Chalapa um, you know, on LinkedIn. Um, I also have a podcast called People Strategy Leaders, where we talk about specifically these things and how to be good leaders, um, and or some of the what are some of the changes that we are seeing in the leadership, especially in this new environment that we are operating in. Uh, so that's a good podcast that they can uh, listen to on Spotify or Apple or Google Play as well. Fabulous. Well, thanks for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks a lot, David. R really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for tuning in today for my conversation with Sri Chalapa. That was great. And if you like the episode, please subscribe, leave us a comment or a rating. Love to hear from you. Please don't forget our sponsor, Habitly.com, where you and your team, companies use this day in, day out to help their people have stronger soft skills. Because in the end, if you want to keep your customers and grow them, you've got to have great soft skills. Check it out, Habitly.com. Thanks again for joining us. Stay tuned. We've got more great leaders, more great guests coming on. Bye for now.